Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! I was visiting Truckee in California over the weekend. There is a great little fishing spot where I tend to find trophy-sized brown trout on the west end of Donner Lake. I carry a two-rod fishing license so I can cast bait on one rod and cast lures on the others. It's also important to know that the bridge has a sign on it that specifically says no jumping or diving from the bridge. So anyway, I'm at this spot under a bridge casting out. It's been a slow day and I haven't caught anything yet. No big deal though. It's just nice to be out with everything going on in the world. The occasional battle border or a kayaker comes by, waves and turns around because there is not much clearance under this bridge and they are respecting that I'm fishing there. So along comes this little kid. I don't see him, mind you, and he starts jumping out of the bridge. As you can imagine, I am not happy. Any chance I had of catching fish just went completely away for a few hours. Fish are frightened very easily, so something like jumping off a bridge scares them and they hide. So I, not so politely, admittedly, tell this kid he needs to stop. He needs to leave. He's not welcome here. I'm on the shoreline, not the bridge itself. And this lady from above starts yelling at me that her kid can do whatever he wants. I, again, not politely, point out the no jumping from the bridge sign. Her kid jumps off again now. And she tells me I need to stop fishing there. She claims they were there first and I was not properly social distancing, so I was violating their privacy. I took a short video of the kid jumping off. And by short, I mean like five minutes long. I tell her absolutely not and continue to cast out. Well, as luck would have it, her kid jumps right into my lure. Not immediately, it was like his tense jump while his mom and I were going back and forth. I'm using a size 6 hook, which is about an inch long, and it jams right into this kid's leg. Naturally, he panics and fails to safely swim back in. He flops around in pain and starts driving the hook deeper into his leg, breaking my line. When he makes it in, sure enough, my lure is sticking out of his leg. There is a little trickle of blood, but being stabbed by a lure isn't actually too damaging. Well, except for the barb on the hook, which prevents it from coming out. So this mom comes rushing down, screaming that I assaulted her baby and caused the police while trying to remove the lure. She also let me know she'll make sure I pay for any long-term damage. I just watch because it's clear to me she has no idea what she's doing, and her attempts to remove the hook are making it worse. I warned her though, and this was her problem, not mine. So the police get there after about 15 minutes and I'm still casting out lures. I already knew what was going to happen. The lady lies and explains that I was intentionally casting at her kid and that they were there first swimming and having a good time. Police come to see my story and just show them my fishing licenses, my setups, and my video of her kid jumping on the bridge. I don't say anything else. I just let them piece it together. So here is the thing. Intentionally missing with a fisherman is a serious crime. They see my lure in his leg, they see I'm here legally, and they see the kid breaking literally the only rule I could prove they broke. They go back to his mom, who confesses as she may have let him jump off a few times, and they explain to her that she's committed a crime, and I may press charges if I want. She looks at me in disbelief and starts screaming about how I maimed her kid. So I explain, less than politely, that I will not press charges if I can get my lure back in the next 10 minutes. A task I know is borderline impossible. So this mom gets to ripping and tearing at the lure, refusing my help, and proceeds to torture her poor kid for 10 minutes. I didn't get my lure back and, true to my word, decided to press charges. The police took the lady away in cuffs and sent for better medics to get the lure out. I'm not sure what happened next, but I didn't get my lure after the paramedics took him away. Ah, not a big deal. It's only like $4. Not that I like losing $4, especially when fishing is my main food source. I wish I could end on a happy note and say I caught a fish, but I didn't. 
I did fetch about two pounds of crawfish though. Also, it's pretty common that random kids mess with the fishermen while we fish. They throw rocks, jump in by our lures, and generally sabotage us. Most kids just don't know better and leave after we tell them to. But some are just real entitled jerks. Background This happened recently where the airline I work for had a Karen show up and ignored the airline's policy for international travel. She was previously denied boarding on the day before for not following the airline policy. She ended up being very belligerent and ended up not flying at all. Side note, I will be hiding some information like Karen's destination, the airline I work for, and names due to privacy reasons, but I will try to disclose as much as I can. The story. I say, Hello miss, may I have your passport please? And what is your final destination? Don't call me miss, stop being so arrogant. Also, why do I have to show my passport? It's in my luggage. I'm not taking out for you. You liars should know that I was denied yesterday and it should be saved on that I'm going to country X. Okay, ma'am, do you have a COVID-19 test and a health declaration to go to country X? Don't call me, ma'am. Stop being rude. If you need to address me, just be direct. You guys lied to me about what I needed to come to country X. You're just some incompetent rookie, and the more you try to stall me, I will get a heart attack from dealing with you all. What happened next was that I tried to get a hold of one of the lead agents at the airline to help assist me with Karen. She ended up walking away from me and straight to the counter ignoring others. Lead agent 1 says, Did you check that lady's documents? The Karen's? No. Well, stop her and ask her for it. I stopped her before she could make it to the counters. Why are you stopping me? I told you I am going to country X. I'm about to go to the hospital to deal with you guys. And when that happens, I will hold everyone here responsible from the heart attack you will give me. Miss, I'm sorry, but I need to verify due to our airline's policy for travel to country X and their travel restrictions. Stop calling me, miss. You're so arrogant. I told you I am not getting it from my luggage. I did my COVID-19 test already. I'm a citizen of country X. My word should be good enough. Stop causing me more stress. I am doing this due to Country X travel restrictions and what it was given on our system for travel to Country X. You're just being rude and your system is wrong. Stop targeting me. Go harass someone else. Please, let me call my supervisor. She walks away from me to the counter where another lead agent was assigned to and another passenger service agent was on. I walked behind the counter and informed the lead agent to what just happened. Hi, lead agent 2. Can I talk to you on a side? Sure. What is the matter? Karen over here is very belligerent. I asked her for her travel documentation and she has refused to show me. Well, let me handle it for now. What happened next? I was not present for the conversation that happened next, but lead agent 2 called the supervisor, who was acting duty manager for the day. And he called the police too due to Karen saying she is about to go to the hospital from a heart attack. She will be denied boarding a second time as she didn't have the proper documentation for travel. And her refusal to cooperate ended up with her speaking with the police and an ambulance crew. In regards to what happened the previous day, I would later find out she again didn't have the proper documentation for international travel. As a disabled person, my life can be a struggle at times. I was involved in a car accident years ago that left me with limited mobility in my legs and since then I've had to rely on a wheelchair to get around. While I try not to let my disability hold me back, there are certainly challenges that come along with it. One of the biggest challenges I face is simply getting around. Navigating crowded parking lots and sidewalks can be difficult and it's especially hard when I need to go grocery shopping. At the store, I often find myself struggling to find a handicapped parking spot. The spots are usually taken by able-bodied individuals who seem to think they are entitled to use them just because they are closer to the store. It is hard for me to understand why people cannot just be considerate and leave these spots for those who really need them. Despite the challenges I face, I refuse to let my disability define me. I work hard to be as independent as possible 
and not let anyone treat me differently because of my physical limitations. I am determined to live a full and meaningful life, and I won't let anything stand in my way. One day, I decided to speak up about the issue of handicapped parking spots being taken by those who didn't need them. I wrote a letter to the grocery store and explained how difficult it was for me to find a spot and how it made me feel when I saw able-bodied people using them. And to my surprise, the store listened to my concerns and made a change, reserving a few handicapped parking spots specifically for those with disabilities. I was thrilled that things were starting to change for the better. But not everyone was happy about the new arrangement. One day, as I was leaving the store, an entitled woman named Karen confronted me in the parking lot. She was upset that I had taken her spot and started picking a fight with me. I tried to explain to Karen that the spot was reserved for those with disabilities and that I had every right to be there. But she just wouldn't listen. She was convinced that I was trying to steal her spot and continued to berate me. It was a very unpleasant and stressful situation and I just wanted to get away from her as quickly as possible. Eventually, I was able to escape Karen's tirade and make my way home. I was grateful to be back in the safety and comfort of my own home, but I couldn't help feeling upset and frustrated about the encounter. It was just one more example of how difficult it can be to be a disabled person in a world that often doesn't understand or appreciate our challenges. Despite it all, I remain determined to live my life to the fullest and not let anyone else's negativity bring me down. Unfortunately, Karen was not finished with me yet. A few weeks later, I found myself in a more aggressive encounter with her in the same parking lot. This time, she took things to a whole new level. What are you doing in my parking spot? Karen demanded, approaching me as I was getting into my car. This is a handicapped parking spot. I replied calmly trying to de-escalate the situation. It's reserved for those with disabilities. I don't care. Karen snapped. I need to be close to the store and I'm not going to let some cripple like you take my spot. I was shocked by Karen's harsh words and couldn't believe she was speaking to me like this. I tried to ignore her and simply get into my car, but she wouldn't let me. She stood in front of my car, blocking my way and continuing to yell at me. Just when things seemed like they couldn't get any worse, a good young lady appeared out of nowhere and intervened. They saw Karen attacking a disabled person in the parking lot and decided to take action. My hero was a young woman in her mid-twenties, with long brown hair and a kind, compassionate look in her eyes. As it turned out, she was also a black belt in a martial art and knew how to defend herself. She stepped in and put Karen in her place, using some fancy moves to detain her and hold her down until the police arrived. Are you okay? The girl asked me, looking concerned. I am now. I replied, grateful for her help. Thank you so much for stepping in. No problem. She said with a smile. I couldn't just stand by and do nothing while someone was being attacked. It's just not right. I was grateful to her for stepping in and helping me out. Without her intervention, things could have gotten much worse. I was relieved that Karen was finally being held accountable for her actions and that I could finally leave the parking lot in peace. However, Karen was not done yet. As the police arrived to arrest her, she suddenly lunged at the girl that saved me, trying to take revenge on her for intervening. But the amazing girl was ready for her. She was clearly a skilled martial artist, and she easily sidestepped Karen's attack and put her down with a swift move. Karen hit the ground with a thud, looking dazed and confused. The police quickly stepped in and subdued Karen, handcuffing her and taking her into custody. I gave them a statement about what had happened and thanked the young lady for the help. You're welcome, she said with a smile. I'm just glad that I was able to help. No one should have to go through something like this. I couldn't agree more. In the end, Karen was charged with assault and harassment, and she ended up having to serve several years in prison for her actions. It was just punishment for someone who had shown such a plate in disregard for the rights and well-being of others. I was relieved that Karen was finally being held accountable for her actions and that she would no longer be able to terrorize people in the parking lot. It was a scary and unsettling experience, but I was determined not to let it get me down. Despite the challenges I faced, I remained determined to live my life to the fullest and not let anyone else's negativity bring me down. 
I was also grateful to the heroic girl for standing up for me and make sure Karen was brought to justice. Their intervention had made all the difference and I will always be grateful for their kindness and compassion. This story begins almost a year ago. I received a call from an unknown number on my cell phone. It was an automated message to call 888 number in regards to serving me papers. I knew right away this may have been a collection agency. Googled the number and confirmed it. Now, I have to disclose I did have identity theft almost 20 years ago. To this day, I occasionally get calls from collection agencies trying to collect on some debt from 20 plus years ago that was cleared. Now, most of the time when I get these calls, now most of the time when I get these calls, I ask for their address to send in a dispute letter including the accompanying data for proof that I had identity theft. Granted, they should not be calling me, but they apologize and I don't get another call. Plus, they usually mail me back and say they closed the account. Well, I went to call this person and I got to say the call was interesting. This woman answered and I gave her my information. She started rattling off a debt that was back in 1995. I let her finish and I told her that I had no knowledge and there was identity theft. As soon as I said that, she freaked out. She kept saying she knew the debt was mine and I'm going to pay. I kept telling her that I wanted to mail a letter, but she flat out refused. When I told her I knew my rights, she said that I had a right to pay the debt. She then said that she's going to put a lien on my huge pretty house. Her words. And she was describing the house to the letter. She also said she's going to put a lien on my Lexus that she sees in a driveway. And she said that my gate in the front won't stop the reposition. She then hung up. Now I know better. All she did was get my info from public records and then saw my house on Google Street View. My guess is that she tried to push this intimidation on other people that know better. So far, it appeared to be a very disreputable company. I also had phone recordings when I called in. And they were legal as I asked her if phone calls can be recorded for quality control purposes. She said, of course. And I said, thank you. I'll take that as my consent. I would have just let this go and just say, this lady was crazy, but I kept in this automated phone calls and I couldn't plug them as they were unknown. I googled the company and I thought they were on Ohio. A couple of flags that led me to believe this were that the person who owned this company in Ohio, an attorney, was being indicted with charges. I placed a complaint with the Ohio Attorney General. They couldn't find any information on what I was submitting. They did call a phone number I gave them. The Attorney General told me they would stop from calling me. But that is all the Attorney General could do. I also complained to the Federal Consumer Finance Bureau who was supposed to be looking into these issues. But they blew me off. Well, three months later, I called this number. I had an idea of maybe pressing buttons, but I called in to see if I could get more information about the company through the IVR. Well, that paid off. As soon as I pressed zero, I got a different company name. I googled that company and got tons of complaints. This led me to the company existing in NY. I complained to the Attorney General of New York was all of my information. I did quite a bit of research over the next couple of weeks and found out a whole bunch of information such as the owner. Found out that the address for the company no longer received mail was at the owner's address, their Facebook account and so on. I then got another one of those unknown phone calls. But this time, it's a different company. I'm sure you get what I'm getting at. The company just keeps changing the name but the parent company still calls. I finally had enough of this. I got a private investigator involved and they were quite satisfied with all the information I got so far. So I let him do his business. When he calls me back saying that this company isn't even registered and it's run by this one lady, I find out the rude lady whom I am talking to is a supposed owner, but not running a legitimate business. I got a process server to file a claim in New York. Granted, I think I could have done it where I was at. But I was heading up to that area in New York anyway, as I had some family reasonably close. 
problems she was not able to be served. A house which she owned she was not able to be served at. Either she was not there or was staying somewhere else. Well, my private investigator started sending out friend requests to her and the people in her friends list. Well, her friends and then she accepted the Facebook request. My private investigator found out that she cheated on her partner about a month ago since she posted that crap. The private investigator gave me an idea of trying to reach her partner and if he can lead us to serve her, I will give him $500. Well, we did that and sure enough, we were finally able to serve this lady at her parents' house about 20 miles from where she was at. I fly up to New York and since it's small claims, it's just me and this lady. For some reason, her mother is there too, but she's not representing. I give the judge all of my information I had over the months and how she broke the law. She broke the collection laws and threats over the phone. After the judge heard all the trouble I had with these calls and how she hid her identity purposely, the judge gave me the maximum amount of $3,000. In New York, small towns and villages are limited to $3,000. After the case, I heard her mother loudly whispering, but I heard it, you better hope he doesn't take your house. Your great-grandfather built this with his own bare hands. I was thinking, hmm, it would be sweet revenge if I could actually put a lien on a house. Well, lo and behold, I found out the house had a second mortgage attached to it. It was the property value of the house and if it sold, I wouldn't end up getting the lien money since the secondary mortgage was almost as much as the house. I was then contemplating how I was going to get the money from this lady. My private investigator called me five months later and said her house is going into foreclosure. I got a proxy to bid for me, but as in most foreclosure actions, the bank buys it back as an REO. I decided to send in a lowball offer to buy the house a couple of months later. The bank accepted my offer. My guess is that it's a small town and trying to get the right market was an issue. You may be wondering why I even bought this house. Well, here is why. This witch threatened to put a lien on my house with no merit. Well, guess what? I freaking took her house. It was completely worth it. It didn't cost me too much and I had the money. The house is actually in decent shape, just a little small. Plus, it will be a nice summer home when I go to visit my relatives. Oh, and I decided to rub salt on a wound. I sent a letter to her parents' address letting them know I took the house. I told them that if her daughter wouldn't be in the business of scamming people, they may not have lost the house. I also go to find out that the Attorney General of New York is now investigating this lady. I hope they throw the book at her. I'm not going to mention the collection agency, but if you stop getting phone calls from them, you're welcome. As I've said in other posts, I'm a retired state park supervisor, so this story is from a while back. Every Monday, we had to turn in weekly reports at our headquarters. There are a lot of things we're supposed to turn in then, but the important one was our weekly financials. That is, accounts for how many camping permits we sold, rentals, picnic or beach passes, and so on, and how much money we took in. We did one for each day and one for the week. I was known as being OCD about them, so mine were always right. And I'd often walk other park supervisors or assistants through any issues they had. On this Monday, I turned in my reports, no problem, and started putting our supply order into the truck. And that's when my boss came out and said, Hey Sundax, can you stop by Dee's Park on your way back? She can't print out her finances. I replied, Yeah, I'll see what I can do. The reason I was asked is that I used to be a systems admin and owned a computer shop before this, and our IT people were notorious for slow response times. As a result, I frequently got called first to see if I could fix it. I didn't mind, because Dee was not just a friend of mine. She'd been my boss when I started and I'd learned a lot about running parks from her. I stopped by and Dee was getting frantic. She told me that everything had worked until yesterday. And while she was able to put the information in, the system wouldn't pull out the report page for printing. I told her to show me what she did, and she pulled up the browser to access our reporting system. And right away I saw the problem. Why are you using Chrome? I asked. Dee replied. What? What do you mean? I just clicked on the icon to do my report. She said that. Now I have no problem with Chrome or Firefox. 
but the official browser was Internet Explorer, the system we used for reports had browser specific scripts, so you couldn't use any other browsers. I explained this to Dee and she growled. It turned out that yesterday her daughter and her grandson had come for a visit, and while Dee had been out taking care of something, her daughter had decided to upgrade the computer by installing Chrome on it. Of course, one of the things it does is to ask if you want to make it the default browser, and she clicked yes. Hence the difficulty in printing reports. It was an easy fix, I just had to change it back, which I did. I then said, now try it, to D. And lo and behold, the report popped up. She thanked me and I said, no problem. Glad it was a simple fix, but tell your daughter not to upgrade the work computers. I left the office and was headed to my truck when this woman came charging up to me. Late 40s or early 50s, sort of chubby, blonde, short hair. Hey Karen, are you the park supervisor? She said that. Um, I'm a park supervisor, but not. That was all I got out. She proceeded to start yelling about how my park ranger had ruined her family's weekend. Now this park didn't have a park ranger. She was talking about D. I tried to get a word in edgewise, but nope. She was on a tear about that witch. I realized I was going to have to wait her out. She proceeded to tell me all about how D had ruined her weekend. While I started mentally adding up the various park rules and state laws this woman and her family had broken, by the time she won down, I counted five park rules, two misdemeanors, and a probable felony, and thought that D must have been in a forgiving mood. She finally ended with, and I want her fired. I said I cannot do that. Why the hell not? Because she's a supervisor of this park. I'm the supervisor of a different park. I can say that I wouldn't have ruined your weekend. Really? Absolutely. If you'd been at my park, I'd have had the police in to give you tickets and then evicted you. I'd have ruined your life, not your weekend. She stared at me for a second and said, I am going to call your headquarters about this. I said, I'm sure you will when you get home. And then I smiled and in a cheery voice added, Now have a safe trip. She huffed, turned around and stormed back to her car. I waved as she left. As her car was disappearing, I heard laughter coming from behind me. Dee had come out of the office and had tears in her eyes from laughing. She said, I can't believe you just did that. Well, I figured I should show her just how much worse it could get. Uh, I always thought people from my former park were exaggerating when they called you the supervisor from hell. I thought you were really easy going, but... I can see now why they called you that. I said to her, I don't like doing it, but when the situation calls for it, well, I released my inner jerk. We left and I went to my park. No, the Karen never called. Or if she did, it never made it back to us. I went to middle school in the early 2010s, right before smartphones really took off. I got my first phone right before starting 6th grade. It was a slight phone with a pay-as-you-go plan that cost 10 cents per minute for calls and per text message sent or received. Worse yet, sending or receiving photos cost 25 cents each. It was very expensive and my parents only gave me $100 a year for this. If I exceeded the amount, I had to cover the rest with my limited purse day and Christmas money I had. Fortunately, most of my friends were good about helping me preserve the balance. They would call and I'd let the call drop but immediately call back on a landline so it wouldn't count as a call. They would email me or message me on Skype for most things. Everything was good until Derek joined the group in 7th grade. At first we thought he was funny but we quickly got fed up with him as he was very unpleasant and exhibited many antisocial behaviors. He started drama within the friend group and also caused issues between us and other kids outside of the group. He was manipulative and always played the victim when others rightfully called him out on his nonsense. And he knew how to charm parents. So getting rid of him was easier said than done. He was the one friend who didn't respect my phone situation. He very frequently texted me dumb memes. Even though I told him multiple times to just email or Skype them to me instead, since picture text messages cost 25 cents each. Unfortunately, blocking phone numbers was a feature 
that was unavailable for this pay as you go plan. So there was nothing I could do as he spammed my phone. One day he got mad at me for some reason and spammed my phone with memes. He must have sent me over 100 lol cats over text. He kept sending them until I lost service since my phone balance was depleted. I had lost $40 remaining in my account as a result. I was extremely pissed and demanded that he pay me the $40 he had cost me and he refused and said it wasn't his problem. I got home from school really upset and told my dad about the situation expecting him to go and tear Derek's mother a new one demanding the money. But my dad said that it wasn't worth the battle. I even asked him about a small claims court but he said that not all battles are worth fighting and that the effort wasn't worth $40. He took me to the carrier store and loaded $50 onto the phone. The carrier changed my phone number and they managed to block Derek's number. They had initially said that blocking phone numbers was impossible with this plan but my dad insisted and would not leave the store until they did it. I was extremely paranoid about my phone number being leaked and other kids spamming it to screw with me. Fortunately, my parents got iPhones that summer and got me one too, and the new family plan had an unlimited text plan. Nonetheless, I was pissed. The $40 he essentially stole from me out of malice. Fortunately, not too long after, there was a big blowout between Derek and the rest of the friend group at the end of the school year that we permanently kicked him out of the group. He was an outcast the following year in the 8th grade. Nobody was tolerating his nonsense anymore. And he changed schools the year after and we never heard from him again. Fast forward to a few years ago, I was back home for a few months between graduating college and starting a new job on the other side of the country. I went out to some garage sales one Saturday morning and I ended up at Derek's house. I recognized his mother, but I don't think she recognized me. I guess glasses and a beard is all you need. I noticed some Pokemon napkins out for sale. But when I picked them up to look at them, Derek's mom said that her son had been obsessed with Pokemon for his whole life and that she was tired of Pokemon stuff occupying her home for so many years. I said that these napkins were for my younger cousin who is really into Pokemon and asked if she had any more Pokemon stuff. She said she didn't know people were still into that and that there were a few boxes in the attic with her son's old stuff. She actually took me inside the house, which I never imagined I'd set foot inside ever again. I let me climb up the attic ladder and take down several large boxes to look through. The first one had Christmas ornaments in it and other junk, but I freaked out inside when she opened a box jam backed with Pokemon video games and the original boxes, though I kept my cool on the outside. The whole reason I had agreed to go inside in the first place was because I was holding out hope of this exact scenario happening. So I knew Derek was obsessed with Pokemon. Our friend group liked Pokemon back in the day, even when other kids thought it was uncool. But Derek was on a whole different level. He bragged about his Pokemon collection all the time. At the time, he had every single main series game in the original box and in mint condition, as he always had to add in. I went to his house once and he was showing me his collection. He yelled at me for touching one of the games. Nobody was allowed to touch them except him. He had many older Nintendo games in excellent condition, but Pokemon was his favorite. He had had a couple of incidents with his mom damaging or throwing away his things. It wasn't out of malice, but just ignorance, as she didn't think that games or collectibles had any value. Fast forward into the present day, I was... Thinking about this when I asked his mother if she had any other Pokemon stuff and she ended up bringing out the mother load. We opened all the boxes she had me bring down. I was in the boxes, there was a beloved collection of Pokemon games, all very well preserved. As well as several Nintendo consoles, hundreds of games, two dozen binders full of Pokemon cards and there was also a box of many Lego sets with the original boxes and everything was many old Star Wars set. When I saw Django Fett's high new I struck gold. I told her that I liked old Legos as well and asked her how much for the five boxes of games, cards and Lego sets and she thought for a second and said $100 a box or $400 for all five. 
I told her I would take it all and hauled myself to get to an ATM. I loaded the five boxes into my dad's truck and immediately drove home. I knew there was potentially tens of thousands of dollars of goods here. This was a score of a lifetime and I finally felt vindicated for the $40 Derek had taken from me all those years ago. I ended up giving all the stuff to my uncle, who is a hobbyist eBay reseller. He offered to sell it all and he was willing to go through the effort and sell everything individually. And despite my insistence, he said that he wouldn't take more than a 10% cut to the profits after all fees and taxes. We went through and logged every single item along with the estimated value. And the total of the whole lot was about $40,000. $40,000 was a poetic number since this was 1,000 times the value of what Derek stole from me all those years ago. My uncle sold most of the lot before the end of the summer and ended up writing me a check. Though it was considerably less than $40,000, it was still a life-changing amount of money for me. I was able to pay off my remaining student loans and put the rest towards a down payment on a new car.